the resident lecture for the COVID um, has just started um, this week. And there were, um, I think, 250 uh, residents logged in to um, the airway talk uh, that Doug Karthik and I gave um, from the five to six o'clock hour. Um, so that was wonderful. So I'm gonna continue uh, that talk. Hopefully it won't be too redundant. The things that are repeated are core concepts about airway reconstruction. Uh, and um, all of the patient photos in here um, are uh, either HIPAA compliant or public knowledge. So I have no financial disclosures. I work with a great team um, and uh, it's a really fun and honorable thing to get to do this. So uh, today we're gonna introduce three core concepts of pediatric airway management and reconstruction. I'll go through some of the um, pediatric ODO tools that we use and we will then describe the special population of traumatic injuries and caustic ingestions. So the history of pediatric airway reconstruction really can be defined in three eras. So the first was the infection era. So syphilis, diphtheria, all created um, uh, really glottic, subglottic, and tracheal stenoses. Uh, and then with antibiotics and the addition of the automobile, there was the automobile era um, where it again, these airway um, pathologies plagued the otolaryngologist. And this was really the dawn of Chevalier Jackson's um, work, who's from Pennsylvania. Um, he was at CHOP, but initially, originally from Pittsburgh where I trained and one of my most prized possession was a um, copy of his autobiography and the first edition given, me, given to me by Peter Koltai when I joined the faculty, which was really special. And then there became the intubation era. So the era. So um, then we we worked on antibiotics. We saved children from trauma, and then we got them intubated. And now the intubation caused problems. And that was really the dawn of um, pediatric reconstructive surgery. And now we're in what I like to think is the the next era, which is the Stanford era. Um, which was, um, uh, you know, have gone from Cincinnati to now my two mentors who are here, um, which has been uh, really wonderful and really fun. So here they are when they were young fellows at Cincinnati, um, and Karthik's here in the room with us, and I know Doug is at home. So uh, we'll talk about, you know, the current state of pediatric airway surgery is really um, the use of endoscopic and open techniques in tandem, um, the value of multidisciplinary care, the importance of pre-op and post-op planning, and then the balance of this triad of breathing, swallowing, and the voice. So core concept number one is the framework concept. Yeah, on the right of the screen, you can see an open uh, and endoscopic visualization for uh, laryngo fissure in the setting of laryngeal web. So when we think about the framework concept, this is how we make the driver between, does this patient need an open operation or is endoscopic uh, potentially appropriate? So if the framework is good, you have some wiggle room to choose endoscopic or open management. This is if there are mucosal or soft tissue components that are significant, but the actual structure of the airway is sound. If the framework is poor, often open management is your best choice. So what makes poor framework? So if there is no cartilage, that is not good framework. If the cartilage is weak, that is not good framework. If there is a congenital cartilage abnormality, such as uh, congenital subglottic stenosis, complete tracheal rings that you see here in the bottom right, or a laryngeal web with a thick, firm subglottic extension. All of these are considered poor framework, and therefore we would um, choose an open type of operation, okay? so. Core concept number two is that you have, just like in plastic surgery, a menu of options that we think of as the airway reconstructive menu. So option one is to expand. These are procedures such as balloon dilation, 
augmentation grafting that you can see here in the upper right hand corner. This is a posterior endoscopically placed um, rib graft, which as Patrick knows, can go very easily or very poorly and frustratingly. Um, it usually takes one or two attitude adjustments to go into place successfully. Uh, the second option is resection. So this may be a tracheal resection, a cricotracheal resection, an extended cricotracheal resection. The third option is slide. So essentially changing length for width. So in this uh, schematic on the bottom right, you have a segment of complete tracheal rings that is um, made uh, cut in the front and the back, filleted, and then reanastomosed um, to trade a long skinny trachea for a short fat trachea. Uh, you can do this in the cervical trachea, in the cervical thoracic trachea on cardiac bypass, and I would argue that in the pharynx or the nasopharynx, uh, we perform Z-plasties as a similar concept to a slide. The last option is replace. Uh, so we're not quite at uh, tracheal um, replacement or free tracheal, tra free tracheal transfer. My personal feeling is that because we haven't figured out the vasculature of how to do that, and I think once we have a truly vascularized flap that that may work. Um, the other uh, concept under replacement is bypass. So this may be an endotracheal tube, um, or bypassing the, the area that you're working on and giving it time to heal. So again, expand, resect, slide, or replace. So some considerations in laryngotracheoplasty, which we touched on in the last hour. Um, so this is a baby that has strider. Yes, it's true. CSB, this is uh, one of our most famous patients who was just reconstructed. Um, so you really want to think about what is the type of graft material, where, where are you putting this graft, in the front, in the back, both, none at all, are you going to do it without any grafting material, um, one stage versus two stage, what kind of stent will you choose, how old is the child and how big are they, so in children who are small, especially less than 24 months, the vocal cords are low and their cricoid is soft and edema can just be a beast in these kids, so um, that can influence your, your choice of um, how to reconstruct them. Uh, so core concept number three, pre-work makes the dream work. So we really rely on our air digestive colleagues. Uh, on the left-hand column is a schematic from Dr. Balakrishnan's recent paper on the value of um, air digestive teamwork in these patients and how the patient flow may look. So they are referred to an air digestive center based on specific criteria. They undergo uh, sometimes 40 to 90 minute intake. Here at Packard, we do this with one of our RMs, um, and very, very complex that will go to an MP or an MD. They decide, okay, we're gonna bring this patient in to meet several subspecialists. Do they need any pre-op imaging, a video swallow study, a chest X-ray? Do they need PFTs or perhaps recent updated cardiology records? When they come to clinic, they usually have obtained those studies in the morning, we see them in the afternoon. It's about a two to three hour visit where they see every provider and stay in the same room. We today had a call to figure out how to do this on telehealth, which is very exciting. Um, the team meets, has a synthesis of findings, give the patient as well as the referring provider a synopsis of those um, recommendations. And then any further diagnostic or therapeutic interventions are done with the same team concept. Um, we usually uh, start with what's called a triple endoscopy, um, which is a single operative procedure with pulmonary, pedzotolaryngology, peds GI, plus minus pediatric surgery to take a look at the patient's entire air digestive system and uh, make some further studies and potentially therapeutics based on that. And then once their treatment is completed, they have a transition out of the program back uh, to their home provider. Sometimes that home provider is the pediatric otolaryngologist, sometimes it's their um, gastroenterologist, most often it's whoever referred the patient to the program. So this core concept number three is really about multidisciplinary evaluation of the patient, the family, and the environment. 
This extends to include not only the patient, including their air digestive tract, their genetics, their heart, but you know, also the family. Are there any other children at home? Should we wait until the viral season is over? We don't consider that as much here in California as I think they do you know, in the Northeast where siblings are bringing home viruses that may influence your management. Uh, we really want to make sure that if we're taking a child for a triple endoscopy that we're getting reliable information. So we'll often cancel the, um, cancel the procedure if the child is sick and we feel like we would not get uh, robust data. We want to know their pre-op environment. Are they coming from a facility? Are they in daycare? What are their exposures? We have to think about their post-operative post environment and the competency of our ICU, especially for single stage procedures. It's very important to have a, a meticulous communication pathway with your intensivist and um, be sure that they feel comfortable calling and asking because we're all really learning together about how to best care for these kids. Um, the um, consensus statement for the structure and function of a pediatric air digestive program um, was authored by uh, Karthik and Doug and some other leaders in the, in the space. And um, really the, um, the consensus statement outlines some minimum standards of what a center should be doing to qualify as an air digestive program. Um, the, um, looking at the otolaryngology, this table is extracted from that. So pediatric otolaryngologists should uh, work on procedures that increase the diameter of the airway, treatment of airway obstruction, treatment for aspiration, surgical procedures to improve voice. Uh, in our clinic, we have our speech pathologists who work with us. This is Dr. Seidel performing a, a functional endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. So Rona and our, our speech pathologist is uh, feeding the baby while Dr. Seidel is getting a view of the voice box. And we're looking for signs of penetration, aspiration, as well as the child's anatomy. So the air digestive preoperative evaluation really starts in the clinic for us with swallow, voice, and all the other things that were mentioned. Uh, this is important because it's a wake, non-anesthetized exam. In the operating room, the concept of going from the lightest anesthetic to the deepest is incredibly important. And we talk to our anesthesia fellows about this every year and are continually working on a core of and an anesthetist team to kind of help us make this more robust. And the reason is because pathology that you can see while the child is breathing spontaneously can be missed or, or even misdiagnosed uh, if the child is too deep to elicit the same dynamic exam. So often pulmonary will start with the patient spontaneously breathing under light sedation. Then the otolaryngologist for rigid bronchoscopy and palpation. Uh, and then our um, GI colleagues and any other ancillary services. The time and the pathway for imaging is always debated. We would always prefer it to be after um, GI so that the child has not um, been on their back receiving uh, sedation for um, hours before. It is all about managing their lungs and really management of the atelectasis that children um, will experience when on their back, even under a light sedation, can make um, a huge difference, not only in our exam, but in the safety of the procedure. So the time that it takes to get the IV, the time it takes to set up the equipment, we really uh, want to minimize atelectasis, especially for children who are chronic aspirators who have other pulmonary comorbidities. And then as soon as we can, we try to get in a, a reasonable endotracheal tube to recruit the patient. Um, there are many benefits for a multidisciplinary air digestive evaluation. Uh, I will point out um, from this paper from our colleagues in Colorado, um, the average procedure time for a triple scope is around one hour plus or minus 15 minutes. Um, so if you look at the otolaryngology, MDLB, GI, and pulmonary bronchoscopy on average, they're, say, they're doing a buy two, get one free, um, essentially. So um, you are saving the operative time for one procedure, not to mention the patient coming through pre-op, you know, the exposure there, parking, missed work. I think it allows us a time to all see what each other are doing, learn from each other about um, our 
practices and multi-specialty care, but also about that individual patient. Um, it also um, saves uh, on cost, which is uh, increasingly important for, um, for our institutions. So specifically to the pediatric otolaryngologist, what are we looking for when we go? So we love spontaneous ventilation. We want to get as dynamic of an exam as possible. You know, we're looking at the airway and the pathology, and those not, are, are not always the same. We want to know if there is a problem, how long is it, how close of it is their trait? Uh, are there any additional lesions? Do they have supersomal collapse, perhaps tracheomalacia, any pharyngeal pathology? If this is a child you're moving towards the cannulation, you know, I, I love to watch the pulmonary bronchoscopy as a sleep endoscopy to say, are they going to need a tonsillectomy or adenoidectomy in order to get their tracheostomy removed? Do they have a laryngeal cleft? If they've had previous airway surgery, has anyone created an iatrogenic tracheoesophageal fistula? These are all considerations, and the most important um, concept here is just, just to be systematic. So just like we were taught to read a chest x-ray, do the same thing every time, look for every problem in every patient, you're more likely to pick up on the subtleties. And so here's a beautiful example of um, the tracheomalacia that was seen on, the, uh, on our rigid endoscopy of the patient that was shown in the previous retractions. Um, it's important to remind ourselves that the dynamic exam of the vocal cords is unreliable with anesthesia on board. Um, it's, um, just something I think to be aware of. If you can see uh, motion, it may be reliable. If you can't, it's not reliable. So I want to briefly touch on some of our most common pediatric. Um, I think we take some of this for granted, um, but it's always a nice reminder. So we'll just start with our kind of workhorse, our endotracheal tube. Uh, so a standard endotracheal tube um, has a radio opaque line in the back. It has a cuff. It is beveled. It has a Murphy eye. Um, residents who have rotated on the PED service recently, we have an anatomy of endotracheal tube lecture to talk about. And so just from the, the start, all endotracheal tubes, as well as all tracheostomy tubes, and the ventilating port of our rigid bronchoscope are all 15 millimeters in diameter. So they will accommodate to any circuit. It is universal. Um, the uh, pilot balloon is obviously for um, uh, as a surrogate of cuff inflation. If you want to deflate the cuff, do not cut off the pilot balloon. Um, this happened in the NICU this week. Uh, the cuff can still absorb um, air in it. Um, the Murphy eye is kind of a backup valve. And um, as we talk about, the endotracheal tube is actually quite politically incorrect. It was invented for right-handed people. So when you take it out of the package, the curvature of the endotracheal tube is such that the bevel will be facing the glottis so that the right-handed um, bronchoscopist or intubator can get a cutaway view of the glottis. And the Murphy eye is opposite this uh, to ventilate the right uh, upper lobe in case of accidental uh, main stem. The other, of course, um, uh, advantage of this is if there are mucus or secretions that are in the way, this is kind of a pop-off valve. And so um, these were made for right left-handed, um, and every endotracheal tube uh, is the same. Uh, if you are, you know, passing a tube off of a Hopkins rod or having difficulty um, traversing the glottis, a counterclockwise uh, motion will rotate that bevel uh, intraluminally, whereas a clockwise motion may send you out into the laryngeal ventricle. And so that's an, also a nice uh, tip that can help in those situations. On the pediatric service, we uh, often talk about the microcuff too. So three O and larger, a few things to know about them. They have no Murphy eye. And the reason for that is that the cuff is more distal and the material of the cuff is more thin. In fact, it's 18 microns thick, which is um, significantly thinner than the traditional ET tube. Uh, the reason for that is uh, it is thought to decrease aspiration. So if you have a thick material as your ET tube cuff, 
think of it as a ball of paper. So if you crumple up the ball of paper, liquid and saliva, um, mucus can still get within those crevices. In the micro cuff tube, that cuff is low and the material is thin and it's thought to be more like balled up saran wrap. There's no money in it, um, but it is thought to form a tighter seal so that when inflated, the risk of aspiration is uh, decreased. As we know, a cuff does not prevent aspiration, um, but that is the thought behind this. It also, anecdotally, I think, makes less granulation tissue and irritation, and we love it for um, patients with subglottic stenosis because it moves the um, location of the AT tube further away from the subglottis. When we are thought, thinking about determining the size of a pediatric airway, uh, we use the Cotton Meyer um, grading system, which is based on a static radial measurement of the subglottis. Um, based on the measurement obtained versus expected measurement for the child's age, you can come up with a degree of stenosis based on the percentage obstruction. So what if if you are doing this often or not often, really um, having a consistent um, algorithm for doing this is key. If you don't want to memorize it all, there is the Cincinnati Airway mobile card, um, which is um, you can have on your phone. It also has great pictures of normal anatomy, so I use it a lot when talking to parents. And what to remember about sizing is it's nuanced. And really the right ET tube is the largest tube that has a leak less than 20 centimeters of subglottic water pressure. And so if you can remember that definition, um, you can remember that if you put the tube way too deep, you're not getting an accurate measurement. If you have an abnormal airway, so tracheostomy tube in place, you're probably not getting an accurate, reliable measurement. Um, this is based on old school stuff, like before there were really cuffed pediatric tubes, and the um, fact that even a deflated cuff can take up a very model space um, uh, uh, transitions such that it's really traditional to size with a pediatric airway, which we as otolaryngologists know, but oftentimes our anesthetists don't use the same lingo. So it's important to communicate with them, yes, with an uncuffed tube. Um, often, if a patient, say, sizes at a uh, 3.5, then we may choose a 3.0 cuffed tube. Um, occasionally, we will bend the rules, and um, the reason for that is just because if the difference um, from an anesthetic standpoint from a 3.0 to a 3.5 is, is really big, um, and they will often ask, can we at least get in a 3.5? Um, and sometimes we will, we will do that or perhaps even choose an uncuffed tube. Um, so we often will say, oh, we're going to do a bronchoscopy, but what exactly does bronchoscopy mean? So for those of you that don't know, this is me, which is one of our pulmonary um, air digestive providers and others. Try to elicit the best information about children uh, with different but complementary techniques. So in a global sense, bronchoscopy can either be diagnostic or therapeutic and really deciding what is the point of what we're doing, why are we looking or intervening, can then help decide who is the best person to bring on the team. So uh, rigid bronchoscopy is uh, with a ventilating bronchoscope. This um, video is a nice eight minute video going through the, um, essentially the anatomy of the pediatric bronchoscope that's uh, I included here for the residents to have for uh, review either on night float or right before a case, it's very helpful. Um, rigid bronchoscopy is great if there is bleeding, or hemorrhage, foreign body extraction. Um, if you need to get deeper, if you're gonna make bleeding or hemorrhage with, if you wanna introduce a um, certain stents or blockers uh, or relieve a proximal airway obstruction and be able to work distally. So this is our kind of traditional ventilating bronchoscope. And I won't go through all the anatomy of it, but uh, the video has a, uh, a really nice synopsis. Just remember that you want to be able to visualize an instrument. So uh, being able to do both of those is uh, a huge advantage. What about this? 
So this is a bronchoscopic telescope. So it's the same telescope, more or less, that is used in a rigid bronch, but we don't have the full bronchoscopy set up. Through this, you can visualize and your instrumentation is very limited. It is great for intubation when the larynx is pretty normal, but the either the trachea or the superglottis may not be. So in children who have complete tracheal rings, we're gonna visualize the trachea. Children who are status post uh, tracheoesophageal fistula repair or uh, evaluation of initial tracheoesophageal fistula, we wanna put the endotracheal tube in a specific position. Children who have Pierre Robin and where you want to kind of navigate that cleft palate and, and uh, glossoptosis with a rigid instrument, uh, this is a great um, tool for that. So you can visualize, not necessarily instrument, except for intubation. What about this? This is also a, bronch a bronchoscope. So this is either called a flexible bronchoscope or a pulmonary bronchoscope. Uh, in ORs 2 and 10, it's already set up for mounts with these. It's great to visualize secondary, tertiary bronchi. It is great to titrate the PEEP. Um, it is more tolerable and with less anesthesia. Some people think that doing a bronchoalveolar lavage is easier with a flexible bronchoscope. Um, in my residency, we actually did all BALs with rigid, um, and I agree it's much easier to do with flexible. Um, the 3.5 endotracheal tube is the smallest that will fit a bronchos flexible bronchoscope with a working channel. If you can get to a 4.0, your optics get way better. Um, the other thing to remember is these are expensive and very delicate. So we treat them like the small children that we use them. Okay, what is this? Brian, what is this? It's a hybrid! So sometimes you may need a rigid piece of equipment to get past a stenosis, but you really want to either um, see something more distal or suction tertiary plug. So this is, you know, a hybrid procedure. We're using these instruments in tandem. And this may be your otolaryngologist and this may be your pulmonologist, right? So how do you know which of these to choose? And it really goes back to accomplish while you're there. So you have to look, you also have to see. So you really want to be able to evaluate the entire airway and the pathology and not miss a diagnosis. I think it's important to be careful, thoughtful, and open-minded. And oftentimes having our multi-specialty colleagues there with us, having an open dialogue is um, very complementary to this uh, type of endeavor. Whatever technique you achieve, you choose, just accomplish the reason that you do for a reason if a child with strider you can't find a reason for a strider then you need to try a different technique um, okay so in summary of core concepts one through three number one the framework how are you going to get there uh, number two what are you going to do once you get there and then number three who's going to be on the team yes I'll turn it up. Thanks, Mighty. Let, let me know if this is better or worse. Um, so these are kind of the three core concepts. Now we're going to transition over to trauma and use these same concepts to evaluate these patients. Okay. So the main difference in traumatic and caustic air digestive in injuries is that pre-op preparation is minimal. Right, so they don't plan to swallow lye. They just do it because they're kids and that's what kids do. There are many factors that can't be controlled. They may have COVID. They may have been managed great or not so great uh, before they get to you. And they have an unknown baseline. So even though they swallowed a foreign body, they may also have complete tracheal rings or laryngomalacia. Um, so it's important to keep an open mind. And so we want to think about how one might apply the core concepts of airway management and keep in mind that trauma may change that algorithm. So this is uh, case number one. We're going to go through three cases. Uh, this is a four-year-old little boy who's accidentally run over by his grandfather in the driveway. He was a traumatic um, presentation to a trauma to an outside hospital. He presented with extreme subcutaneous emphysema, um, was cannulated onto ECMO uh, for respiratory failure. 
You can see that he has extreme subcutaneous emphysema throughout his mediastinum. He has air where it shouldn't be and no air where it should be. Uh, and this is a CT of the chest for him. Okay. So here is an endoscopic view of his injury. So what do you think is the status of the framework? Is it good or bad? How do you choose from the reconstructive menu? And would this patient benefit from multidisciplinary management? Okay. Okay. So I can tell you that yes, of course, this patient would benefit from multidisciplinary management. So this is kind of the initial look at him. I'll switch over so you can see the injury here, right? So he has a tracheal separation. Uh, or tracheal laceration, separating the membranous posterior tracheal wall from the cartilage, right? And it's a persistent air leak into his mediastinum. Uh, there's one view in this 25-minute video where you can actually um, kind of see fora out in that hole, which is kind of scary, right? So from your reconstructive menu, what do you want to do? So we're not going, so we think about his framework is actually pretty good. So his parts, his cartilaginous structure is still intact, right? So we don't need to take out any of his cartilage. We need to work with the cartilage that we have. So he does not need an open repair of this at this junction. Number two, how do we choose from our reconstructive menu? Or do we want to make it bigger? Do we want to expand it? Nope, it's big enough. Uh, do we want to resect it? There's really nothing to resect nor slide, so our only option is to replace or bypass. So that is exactly what was done. So you can see here, uh, working through the bronchoscope, a um, bronchial blocker is placed in the right main stem bronchus, a right bronchus intermedius past the hole, which is over here, okay? And then, easily or not so easily once the bronchial blocker is in place, the patient is main stemmed into the left bronchus, okay? This remind you, this patient is on ECMO, um, and so we're not relying on the lungs for ventilation um, at this point. So over the course of about two weeks, this patient underwent nine bronchoscopies from the otolaryngology service as well as the pulmonary service. We started with a huge hole and uh, by the two weeks, two to three weeks later, we had two very small areas of, concerned, of concern. This picture is with our pediatric surgery fellow, Enrico, holding the ECMO cannulas and really positioning the head to facilitate placement of these bronchial blockers. And then this is his family in the ICU uh, or, um, after extubation. So what we learned from this uh, procedure is that as children, as fast as children can heal, they can unheal. So you really want to protect the area that you're trying to heal by bypassing it. Isolate that injury from bear trauma, suction trauma, secretions. Uh, we are very vigilant to do everything under endoscopic guidance and really load the boat on the people who knew about him and were um, managing his airway. The main takeaway from, from Briar's case is that kids can heal. Okay, now we're gonna move over to this patient, her uh, CL. So she's a two-year-old, she has progressive dyspnea, sleepiness, and lethargy a few weeks after traumatic intubation. She is transferred uh, in the night from another hospital um, for these concerns. And this is the video that was sent, um, this is just a still of the video that was sent with her um, from another institution. So to orient you, uh, this is her feeding tube going into the esophagus. This is her tongue base, and this is her supraglottis. Uh, and so she has what used to be two arytenoids and basically melded those into what is now her tongue base. You, we actually could at one point dig out the cartilage of her epiglottis up here, um, but you know, this is how she presented. So again, thinking about the three concept of airway reconstruction. What's the status of the framework? 
how do you choose from the reconstructive menu? And then does this patient benefit from multidisciplinary management? Okay. So the status of her framework under all of that uh, wasn't great. Um, and so she required all of the reconstructive menu. We began by bypassing it. So she got a trach below this area, okay? And then once she was cooled off, um, we did some balloon augmentation, dilating her subglottis, making mucosal expansion flaps. She, excuse me, she got essentially a slide with fring, uh, pharyngoplasties and Z-plasties uh, to expand her upper airway. When she was um, out of the hospital, we worked um, with speech, pulmonary, she had and eventually we got her to a uh, not normal but functional marriage. Uh, please use the microphone. Okay. Okay. Uh, at, uh, can you hear me? I think you're covering the microphone. Yes, we can now. Thank now. you. Wow. Gotcha. Um, and now 12 months post-injury, she was decannulated uh, last week. So what we learned from Candace is that kids can really heal. So if you have a patient that has a trauma or a traumatic event, it's important to continue to follow them um, for the weeks to months after their injury. So remember, this patient was had a traumatic intubation two months before we saw her. And perhaps had she been um, had serial endoscopy or evaluation in the meantime, you know, this could have been at least somewhat thwarted or prevented. Um, I love this picture. This is not her. This is a recent um, patient we saw a few months ago in the cardiac ICU who had um, some strider post extubation um, and not after his cardiac surgery. And not only did he develop um, a posterior glottic scar band, he developed a subglottic scar band. So he um, is, a, is a very good healer. Um, uh, so management can involve different options from the reconstructive menu along the patient's journey. And then lastly, air digestive management will extend beyond just your perioperative window into their voice, swallow, decannulation, and being sure their uh, pulmonary and GI health is optimized for that and for their entire growth and development. Okay, moving on to the third case. Um, this is an 18 month little boy who was playing with his twin brother and a bag of batteries, which is never a good start to a story. Um, he, mom noticed that he started refusing some milk and then a few hours later started drooling. The timeline is a little sketchy, um, but mom called the pediatrician who called the on-call pediatric otolaryngologist. So, um, what would you do? What would you tell the on-call um, transfer center? What would you tell mom on the phone? So you have a high suspicion that this kid has a battery ingestion. He's showing signs of caustic ingestion. So this is, a, this is actually the poison control um, algorithm. It's very detailed. Um, and I put it on here as a reference. Um, I'm gonna zoom into a, another algorithm. Um, it's a little bit more simple, not quite as comprehensive. But there are some salient points, I think, that all of us should remember, especially those of us that do um, pediatric airway triaging and pediatric patient triaging. So um, you wanna get the family to care as close as possible, as soon as possible. You know, you don't want to send them to the to their PCP. You don't want to bring them to clinic. You want to get them to the ED. And depending on the family's resources, sometimes that might mean calling 911. Don't induce vomiting. Um, and recently, the guidelines have had stated that um, giving honey. Um, which the um, ease of doing this is somewhat debated. Every ten minutes uh, can be beneficial. So on route to the ED, start giving the child honey. Uh, they should get an x-ray to locate the battery and then proceed for immediate removal. Do not admit them to the pediatric floor for um, waiting for the OR. This should be kind of a um, acute, urgent, emergent case. This would 
not need COVID testing. Um, the other thing is if the child is waiting, you can give a dose of caraphate, uh, but it should not delay um, their, their care at all. Um, the important thing to think about is in the operating room, you really wanna note a few things which we'll go into, and this is a great time for multidisciplinary evaluation. So oh, a few um, points on honey. So honey really has become a topic in the past five years about um, the use of it in pediatric battery ingestions. So this is a um, pig model um, that was published in Laryngoscope last year looking at the utility of saline, honey, and caraphate as a preventor of um, mucosal injury in um, this model of button battery ingestion. The things to know about honey is the mechanism of action is thought to prevent local generation of hydroxide ions, thereby delaying alkaline burns. It's um, recommended to use non-artisanal honey as certain flowers in honey can be toxic to children. You don't want to tell the parents to you know, go to the 7-Eleven or the grocery store to get the honey, just if they have it, give it. If they don't have it, get to the ED. And it's a rule of 12. So if the kid took the um, button battery, if the suspected ingestion was 12 hours or more, um, don't give them the honey because they are at such a high risk of esophageal perforation. If the child is less than 12 months of age, don't give them the honey because there's a risk of botulism. Um, Intra-op, uh, it's important to remember negative, narrow, necrotic. And so the negative anode of the battery, um, which on a lateral film is the more narrow side, is the bad player. And so if you can note um, whether that faces anteriorly um, towards the trachea or posteriorly towards potentially the great vessels um, or the spine, that's uh, important intraoperative findings. Taking as many endoscopic photos as possible, measuring the distance um, of the injury, not only in its own length, but uh, its length either from the carina or the glottis or some uh, repeatable um, measurement is important. Taking a photo of the battery and assessing um, whether or not mucosa comes off um, out of the body with the battery is important. Um, and then if you can orient where the negative anode is um, and think of that that is your highest area of necrosis, um, that can help um, anticipate their complications. So you're in the OR, and these are, um, Mike Chang gave us these um, photos of a, of a patient this year, and you see this in the esophagus, so now what do you do? So how do you approach the management of this framework? So again, you wanna think about the status of the framework, you, um, from the tracheal side, the trachea being your framework, you want to also do a laryngoscopy and bronchoscopy and see if there's a hole there. You may not always see it from the esophageal side. Uh, you want to choose from the reconstructive menu. Obviously, this, in this situation, we're not going to expand, we're not going to resect, we're not going to slide, we're going to bypass. Um, and then you want to um, think about air digestive management and intra-op um, GI consult um, may um, offer to uh, irrigate this. Um, the current recommendations are with um, quarter percent acetic acid uh, to neutralize the tissue. And um, you want to think about how to manage this kid's airway. So um, as you can imagine, the patient with a significant esophageal injury is not going to swallow well. They're going to have poor secretion control afterwards. They're also at risk for unilateral or bilateral vocal fold immobility. Um, and so keeping them intubated is a good idea. If there's any role of imaging. So if your battery is adjacent to any of the great vessels, uh, it is wise to get cross-sectional imaging. Um, you need at least three millimeters of tissue between um, the uh, esophageal injury and the adjacent um, vasculature. So MRI can be very helpful, MRA and seeing this. Um, if the patient is unstable, you may opt for CTA. It's a much faster exam. 
So uh, it's important to observe and prepare for delayed complications. So this is that same patient. This is their um, airway exam at 10 days. And you can see the um, cricoid um, mucosa, it, the mucosa overlying the cricoid is not totally normal. It's a little bit pale. Um, palpation of the cricoid um, revealed intact cartilage. It was not soft, uh, but you can see there was uh, some tracheal um, change, even though the negative anode in this situation was faced posteriorly. Um, immediate complications are um, airway um, problems, recurrent laryngeal nerve problems, either unilateral or bilateral, and then pneumothorax. Within the first week, patients may present with tracheoesophageal fistula, esophageal perforation, and the complications therein, such as mediastinitis, um, empyema, if there is a, a lung loculation, um, esophageal stenosis, uh, up to one month. So esophageal um, a Aortic fistulas have been um, reported up to 28 days after, and we have advocated at Packard to keep children either in the hospital or at Ronald McDonald um, for close surveillance. And then weeks to months afterwards, they can develop strictures or inflammation of the spine. So the learning points for this case is that multidisciplinary key uh, care is key. It involves a whole team, um, which may include in your extended air digestive family, such as the ICU or cardiac surgery. For this particular patient, we also made sure that um, the, all the right equipment for a possible um, large vessel and a, um, uh, fistula was there, such as a Blakemore tube, and that people who are around knew how to use that. Um, it's important to keep an eye on this kid. The, this um, patient uh, then transitioned back to Valley and then had uh, subsequent uh, imaging. Um, you want to make sure you perform flexible laryngoscopy, get an esophagram, and we really keep these kids on a soft diet for up to a month afterwards to promote healing of the esophagus. And um, the key here is to remember to load the boat with people and um, continue that management and diligence through the time period of possible complications, which can be months. Um, this is a patient currently on our service who we suspect had an undiagnosed um, button battery at one point and has a very large uh, TE fistula. Um, uh, just a quick comment on caustic ingestion. So caustic ingestion, um, especially alkaline substances, really peaked in 2014, um, which was uh, thought to be related to the um, introduction of Tide Pods and their cousins into the, um, into the marketplace because they are cute and they look like candy and kids want to eat them. And then there was a big um, campaign to um, label these and put them under pediatric um, safe protectors so that kids couldn't open it. And we've thankfully seen caustic congestion drop. I will say that since I've been at Packard, I've seen no detergent ingestions, but a ton of cleaning substance ingestions. Um, and essentially the management is very similar in the sense that multidisciplinary um, care is key and you have to prepare and anticipate delayed complications. So um, this is a patient who ingested um, LA's Awesome Cleaner, which turned out to be not so awesome. Um, they had some slight oral burns. Um, important to remember that oral burns are not always correlative, and it's important to do a thorough evaluation um, of the patient. Um, the injury spectrum, just like in battery ingestions, continues along a time course. Um, there's acute injury inflammation, granulation, fibrosis stricture. Um, and so keeping an open mind about these kids and really taking a long-term ownership is important. So in conclusion, the really the three core concepts of airway reconstruction are how are you going to get there? Is what is the framework of this child? Um, once you get there, what are you gonna do about it? From our reconstructive menu, will you explain, expand, resect, slide, or replace bypass? Who's on the patient's team? So multidisciplinary evaluation, uh, learning your patient's family, 
considering their post-operative um, disposition. And then as this applies to our traumatic and caustic um, pathology and presentations, I think really the three uh, takeaways are that kids can heal, kids can really heal, and then kids can change and evolve. And so thinking about all of these uh, as a um, comprehensive um, approach to these uh, challenging cases um, is, is really fun and really rewarding. And you get to go from airways that look uh, like this, where you think this patient is really gonna end up with some type of um, laryngeal reconstruction. Um, and sometimes just with diligence and medical management, you can get them a little bit better and then you have very grateful parents that, you know, the kid is now a year old and they're happy and wishing you all the best through the COVID. And so it's really fun to get to do this. And um, I couldn't do it without all of these people. Um, this is our Air Digestive and Airway Reconstruction Center overview. Um, this is our team and it's getting um, bigger by the day. We're um, looking forward to welcoming two uh, additional practitioners in the upcoming weeks. Um, and I just wanna thank uh, Doug and Karthik and Alan for their great support and mentorship. Thanks. Okay. Kara, very well done. Very well done. We have about uh, like 10 minutes, I think, for some questions. Yeah, Kara, in the old days, we used to pass a string when we first uh, scoped the patients with the caustic ingestions. Do you still do that for retrograde dilatations later? Uh, so that's an interesting uh, question. So sometimes we will. So they, um, especially with our uh, GI uh, colleagues, we've had a run, honestly, of um, tracheoesophageal fistula patients. So we've seen a lot of esophageal strictures uh, in that population, and we are doing a lot of above and below um, scopes in coordination with them. Um, we haven't seen it as much for uh, caustic ingestions, but it's certainly um, part of still the working horse of um, air digestive management. Now that we have our colleagues that can do it with scopes, we're not using strings as much, but uh, they are using uh, introducers and dilators and Fogarty catheters and all kinds of uh, interesting tools. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is uh, comments on long-term malignancy risk after uh, caustic ingestion. And uh, the data says that up to um, a thousand-fold increase in esophageal cancer um, after esophageal uh, injury or significant esophageal mucosal damage. So um, that is uh, important for surveillance. It's also important for how you manage these children. So if you have a child who has a dysfunctional esophagus, um, you one could argue that you can put in a g-tube and that they um could be well served by that which is obviously true but uh if you also want to decrease their uh, risk of uh, malignancy later either a colonic or um or other interposition graft or esophageal replacement um is uh, often performed and our pediatric surgery colleagues are most often to do that So, what else? I think he emailed me one. I know that I want to pull up my email and add this. Kara, this is Doug. That was an awesome talk. Um, the, uh, there's a lot of awesome surgical interventions, and I think it's great that how you contrasted patients who have severe injuries like the patient who was run over by his uh, family member, quite unfortunately, and how doing less was something that actually gave the patient so much more. And you had to actually stand up, you know, and say to many people who said, no, we need to open this kid up and operate on him. You had to tell them, no, this isn't necessarily the right thing to do. We need to actually be patient and understand our, our anatomy. And so, I could tell that that's not always the easiest thing for you to do um, or for anyone to do for that matter. Um, but sometimes not operating is the right thing. And that was a, a excellent um, demonstration of that point. Thanks. 
So just to be clear, Doug did, I think, uh, seven of those Bronx and I did too, but uh, it's really important to work together. And it's really fun uh, to get to see these kids and, and learn together because, you know, the next time that this uh, situation comes up, we'll remember that sometimes uh, less is more. That's true. And, and the point is, though, you know, with an airway team and, and with a, a strong uh, surgical division that's growing and actually is a greater presence in the hospital, when you have decisions to make that are tough, um, standing shoulder to shoulder is, is what we need to do. And so um, you're a big part of that. And the rest of our division is a big part of that. So. Ryan, any questions? Okay, give everyone a few more minutes for questions, but if there aren't any, um, thank you so much.